now everyone seems to be doing it. And there's kind of this fear that I have that we're just doing like decorative distractions because we have the capabilities to do it, so we're doing it. If you're designing for a user, go and talk to that person or that person representing a, a, a group that this product is relevant for. We reached a point with design tools where they feel like they're guiding the way we're actually creating things and too much control has been handed over to them rather than sort of the more individualistic um, custom stuff that when we're creating things as designers. I mean, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? I think we have made a lot of progress with um, design tools and that's very good because it makes it very easy for a lot of people to, to pick up a tool and design sites and to me or applications and to me that ties in with um, design systems that often, right, you can load whole libraries. I'm working on a project right now where we, we have to use material design and I can just load all the components and, and we can start doing that. Um, and that's great, it speeds up the process, but it also means someone who is not very experienced can make something that looks good, that seems to make sense very quickly without actually thinking it through because that's not their job. And so they're not designing with necessarily the right intent. They can put all the things together, but they're not thinking through uh, visual hierarchies, um, inf information architecture, how, how pages fit together, user journeys, all those things um, might not um, be designed for. Each screen is designed for on its own, and so that will look good. But if then someone starts using it, things kind of might fall apart or don't really make sense or become uh, confusing. And that's because the tool makes certain things easy, but it doesn't replace someone using intent in every kind of design decision, laying out information, deciding what information goes on a page or doesn't go there um, and how things tie together. Do you think they're making us more lazy then? Or potentially um, making uh, the makers of things not consider context in, or like quick wins, easy fixes? I don't think they make us lazy. I, I think what they do is they make it even harder to um, do good design in terms of their business person, right? Someone in management commissions a job and, and sees a junior person can kind of do something that looks all right, because that's often how, how they look at things, right? Oh, this looks fine. Then why do we spend so much time on information architecture or visual hierarchies? That, that isn't, that, those are not concepts that um, they're familiar with. And for them, it's this looks okay, colors match, the buttons, it's consistent, so it's fine. And so I think in some ways, they make it a lot easier and faster to do things. But in other ways, um, they make it a bit harder to um, defend why things take time, why th the invisible things of design um, just need to, need to always be there. And they just, you, the tool doesn't replace that. So in terms of a, um, in UI design, it's like motion animation is quite popular now. And it's, we, we, we've come to a point where before, to, be, to understand animation and motion was quite complicated. You had to have some sort of animation background, or at least understand how um, the human eye works. But yeah. now everyone seems to be doing it. And there's kind of this fear that I have that we're just doing like decorative distractions because we have the capabilities to do it, so we're doing it. Uh, and I know you've done a lot of studies with eye tracking yeah. and the interfaces about like how someone can navigate through something using their eyes. I've done a lot of research on HCI and, and, and UX and I've built a lot of prototypes and I've started with doing just eye tracking studies, looking at right, where people look on the screen and how you lay out the information that it makes sense. But then what I found a lot more interesting is actually building interfaces that people can explore with their eyes. And when you get to that point, it becomes even more critical to think all of those things through because you don't want any information that distracts. And you, need to, you need to really actively think about at every step in time where you guide the, the, the person's eye because that's the only way for them to, to, to navigate around. And um, visual attention is very limited and it's linear. And as the eye moves, um, it, it abstracts a lot of information so our, our, our eyes um, kind of are not getting the rich picture that we think we are getting. Most of that is actually processed by the brain and interpreted based on uh, experience, previous knowledge and so on. 
Um, so what we are seeing isn't really what the eye is perceiving. And so it's very important to design, uh, again, with intent for, for those things. And a lot of, especially for mobile apps, tools nowadays, um, come with all kinds of animation builders that you can do. And again, what the risk is that you're losing the intent in what is the purpose of that animation. So, for example, you have, if you touch a button, right, and it kind of glows up, so, which is one of the material design things that makes a lot of sense because that is the intent. It confirms visually that I am selecting this button. But then I was just looking at the, the Google Calendar, for example, where you can, if I create an event, I can choose the color that I want to code this event in. And then the whole header changes. And it uses the same animation. And yeah, it looks nice, but it over-focuses, right? It takes me off my journey. I'm trying to create this event. I'm filling in all the details. Maybe there's a reason why I want to change the color. And suddenly half of the screen is animating the color change. That is unnecessary. It doesn't serve any purpose other than a little bit the vanity of the designer wanting to say, well, I can do this, and it, it looks cool. Um, but it, it distracts the user. And it's maybe not... Uh, a highly critical situation in that case. It's just a little bit maybe frustrating or annoying, um, but it's the general uh, risk that you actually just designing for the animation's sake. Dark Sky, the, the weather app. I, I really love that app. Um, and it, it, it's very nice for looking at right weather in the next 10 minutes, half an hour and so on. Um, but the, the key animation or the, the, the key interaction with it is just sliding left and right from your, your day view to like my different locations and then there's this this global map where you can look at the temperature and the rain kind of on, 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 on a world map you're swiping left to to get to that view um, so what this communicates to me is i can swipe right again to go back to the other view but i cannot do that because i'm now in a, in a globe mode where i rotate the globe and I don't need to hunt for the, the X in the corner to go back. Um, so the animation is there because it's a common thing. You swipe left and right to switch between screens, but it doesn't make sense. Um, the, the, the right way to, to, to uh, design that interaction would be to make the, the, the map accessible from the place where you exit it again. So, so they are consistent and, and they meet the, the user's expectation. Where I go to it, I can go back to, to the other screen. Or you can spend more time thinking about how to solve the problem and, and come up with a completely different interaction. But the inconsistency um, is just what, what breaks this. And, and it is introduced because it is so tempting because these animations are cheap and you can add them easily and you don't have to think through the, the problem. I think it's just it. basically gloss which makes the thing look like you've done something amazing even though it's just the setting that you've just included. I think there is this temptation because animations are, I think, today a hot topic and uh, it's something that would have been traditionally very hard to do and you can do it kind of out of the box. You pick the animation you want, just like people, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, maybe even now um, in PowerPoint, do all these slight animations just because they can and they didn't make any sense. And I'm not saying it's just it's that bad now, but it's that easy to, to use them and not having to think about why am I actually using this and does it help at all? Um, and just as you, you would use visual hierarchies to think through how you organize information, right? Where's the header, where's the a title, and how does the paragraph text fit in, and how is the user's eye going from, from one place to the next? Uh, the same applies to, to animation, as it guides you from one screen to another, or from one place on the screen to another. The intent is to guide the, the user's eye from, from one place they're looking at to the next that is relevant for them. Um, especially if they're in a journey where you're designing to make pain go away. So I have a problem, I need it solved, it's a shopping journey or it's, I don't know, I need to fill in a form. You want to guide the user through this as quickly as possible. So there's little cognitive load and the pain goes away quickly. If you're designing for delight, um, because it's something entertaining or it's a game, then it's obviously different and the animations have a different, completely different purpose. But I don't, again, I don't think people think along those lines necessarily enough when they're using those tools and but adding isn't, animations. Isn't that basically down to experience, though? I mean, I mean, I, mean, I think we all look for um, the answer. You know, I mean, from some of the videos I've done like before, it's always like everything's about the answer. I want this checkbox for performance. I want a checkbox for accessibility. It's like 
Is there an answer in UX? Is there something that someone could actually do or approach, like principles that they can look at, at least to have a starting point? Because unless someone is an expert like and has studied these things, how would they know? Um, or is it? do you feel that they're just not people, as, as an industry, we're not necessarily thinking deeply enough about the problems that we're trying to solve? Yeah, so I, I think a good starting point is always to look at some of the psychological theories behind it and the principles. And one thing I think is very important, and when I interview people, I, I always try to probe for, for their knowledge in those, is uh, Gestalt laws or Gestalt principles. And Gestalt laws are basically rules uh, psychologists came up with those in Germany. They're basically just rules that describe how human perception works, how the brain tries to make sense of information. And there's different laws of proximity, of continuity, of um, uh, simplicity, um, that for example, if you look at different shapes and some are complex, that's complexer than others, that we, we find the simpler ones appealing, right? And that, that drives design, that's why products look often sleek when they have very simple shapes and so on. And there's laws that mean that we're looking for things that are familiar to us. So if we're seeing something we can't recognize, the brain will try to make sense of it and will try to make us um, see things that aren't actually there. The, the more common laws would be um, obviously related to alignment of information, um, of grouping, so if how you lay out things, right? So a very Concrete example I, I like to, um, or that's very dear to me personally, is if you use white space, right, and how you group things together to, to make them appear as uh, relevant to each other, is, is just to use white space rather than lines, right? Lines is a, um, to, or like outlines to group things is, uh, is another way, but it's often a cop out, right? It's Using white space. Way. Yeah, to do it. Um, and so these laws, relate to um, how human perception works and I think it's critical to understand those in order to use tools that come with design uh, systems and that make it very easy to, to put things on a screen and lay them out to understand those rules and those laws um, to, to design better experiences. So if you're a developer coming into this today or like a designer What's the first thing they should really be looking at when trying to solve a problem? If I was a developer or if, if I would have a developer to, to design something, I would probably yeah, tell them to take a step back, not just start playing with the tools straight away and do some reading. And I think reading on psychology would be a good thing, Gestalt laws, human perception. And a very, very useful book is uh, Universal Principles of Design. It has those kind of laws and a lot of other laws. Uh, um, beauty bias, all kinds of things that explain why people uh, perceive things the way they do, why they make decisions the way they do, um, why they like certain things more than others. Um, and so it has the theory on one side and it has really nice concrete examples on the other. And it's, it's very accessible and it's, I think it's a very um, approachable book to familiarize oneself with, with that. How do you do your research? Well, user research you should always do. Right. Um, so yes, if you're designing for a user, go and talk to that person. If you're not familiar with with doing user research, it's very tempting or it's very easy to ask the wrong question. Right? How do you like this? Right? Um, should we do it like this or like that? Right? And those are not the right questions to ask. What you're trying to do is you're trying to um, understand again the. Let's say let's stay, stick within the kind of solving kind of a, a, a real problem. Uh, the user's pain. You're trying to understand what is it that is bothering them, or that's hard for them. That you want to design uh, something that makes it easier for them. In with, with that regard, if if for example, I should suggest what's the best way to do research. There is something called um, master and apprentice model in interviewing, and it's for contextual interviews, um, and it basically tells you that when you interview a user you are the apprentice and the user is the master. He's the master of what he's trying to do and he's telling you what's the problem and you are there to learn about what's his problem. Um, you're not telling him or you're not trying to explain why the prototype works in a certain way. That's not your job. Your job is to understand why it doesn't make sense for him. Um, so that would be another thing. Contextual interviews um, would be a good thing to read up on. Uh, one last thing. I mean, uh, I remember uh, Alan Cooper's the, the, the the UX guru who came up yeah. with 
this idea of personas. I remember in the early days looking at personas, we would look, uh, you'd think, okay, what's the person's demographic? But he yeah. really dislikes this idea. It's like the demographic doesn't tell you anything. I mean, what do you think about um, defining a persona or user persona? We, we actually, we just had a workshop yesterday um, and we used empathy maps before and I used that, that template again yesterday. Um, I think traditional personas that are based on kind of demographic information are for marketing. If you want to narrow down, right, who the group of customers is that you're targeting. Um, but I think a lot in, in, in software design, the experience is a lot more personal you want to go a lot deeper because you're designing specific journeys for a specific purpose for a group of people. And so the only way you can do that well is by talking to them, by understanding the groupings, of course, but understanding the real pain on why the, uh, the mother in the morning, when she has to bring the kids to school, forgets something, right? You, 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 a, per, a traditional persona wouldn't describe that, right? The way you, you understand this is by going there, observing it, um, and seeing the problem. And then when, once you understand it, and you can actually understand it by just talking to maybe five similar people um, for that specific problem, um, you can then come up with uh, uh, something um, to, to help fix it. You replace the word blue with the word green, <laughs> and now you have a green sky. You make it sound so easy. <laughs> it really is. Like, like I've got 12-year-olds coding full VR scenes in, in under an hour.